turn to the book of Philippians, chapter number 2. Now, while you're doing that, it's already been good to be in the Lord's house. and everybody say it? Amen. However, I do want to ask a couple of questions. And we'll do this by show of hands real, real quick. How many of you are parents, grandparents, or perhaps have been involved in the raising of a niece, nephew, or another child that means a lot to you? That's you. Raise your hand. How many of you know your children or anybody that you just said you had a hand in raising are not perfect? Raise your hand. How many of you know that when somebody else criticizes them, though, you bow up about it? Raise your hand. Yeah. Pray for you, me and my mama's here today. You can take that up with her. <laughs> the truth be told, mama will probably join in with your tray and pick on you. That's all right. So it's already been good, and let's look in God's Word today. Philippians chapter number 2, very familiar text. Verse number 9, and just three verses to begin with this day. As we look at the result of exaltation. The result of exaltation. Verse number 9, God's word says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's the reading of God's word, and everyone said, Amen. God, we come to you with a melt, uh, just uh, before you right now, just asking you to melt our hearts. And if any preaching is to be done today, Lord, we pray you do it. For you've already been working in the hearts, minds, and lives of these folks. Now, Lord, you've uh, uh, worked and descended on this place and filled us with your love and mercy and your sweet presence. We pray you would have your will and way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and be seated as we look at a very familiar passage that reminds us of where Jesus should be in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. In my life, uh, I would like to tell you that Jesus is number one in my heart and in my life, but sometimes it's hard necessarily. If you look at my calendar, you may not think that that's where He is. We need to understand where He really is supposed to be. And when we look in Philippians chapter 2, these three verses, we oftentimes uh, 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 paraphrase these or look at these in a real sense, but we need to understand where He should be. Can, can we all agree as we begin that Jesus should be number one to us in all areas of our life? If that's true, say amen. amen. And when we think about that, we need to be reminded that we're not the first people or the only people because if we were transparent, if we were honest, if we allow God to be honest with us today, there are times, there are weeks, there are uh, uh, moments, there are whatever you want to fill in the blank there in which Jesus, frankly, is not the most important thing to us, or we let him slip down the depth chart just a little bit. In Revelation chapter number 2 and verse number 4, Jesus, in, in, in the words read in your Bible, if you have a Bible, his words are in red. It simply, the church of Ephesus says this, he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Uh, now, we all have done that from time to time. If we were just totally honest, one with another, we were totally honest before the Lord today, we've left our first love, and sometimes we didn't mean to. There's times in our human relationships that we've not taken care of relationships like we should have. It slipped up on us before we knew it. We weren't the husband we needed to be. We weren't the dad we needed to be. We weren't the worker we were supposed to be. We weren't about anything we were supposed to be, and we didn't mean for it to happen. It just happened over time. Now, I know that people in this part of the state don't have that problem, but people down in Southeast Tennessee struggle with that. So I just want you to be aware of that and guard yourselves against that. But the church in Ephesus, he says, simply you've left your first number love. Well, if we've left our first love, Jesus here, I think, has got a place in your heart. Where is it? And if Jesus isn't number one, there's two areas that I think it falls into the category. If Jesus is not number one, then if you're a born again a Christian and Jesus is not number one, the two areas are simply this. It's either back, uh, backsliding or idolatry. That's right, Shane. That's good. We need to hear that. Now, here's where we're going with that. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14 says what? Well, the backslider in heart is filled uh, with his own ways. And when Jesus is not number one to us in all things, what we end up doing is we slip ourselves up, our spouse up, our children up. Uh, we make a reason and rationalization why we can't be at church and be about God's business and be obedient to what God's call on our life is. And what we end up doing is we end up backsliding. 
backsliding, and backsliding is simply this. Anytime you allow something to come in front, then you are backsliding because we become filled with our own ways. And the number two, then, there's idolatry. Uh, turn with me, if you will, over to the uh, book of 1 John, or just write it down. You don't have to turn there. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21, where it's important enough that uh, the book closes by saying, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. As the one uh, you all know, my spiritual hero, one of those people, Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers would say, an idol is anything you fear more, love more, or pay more attention to than the Lord Jesus Christ. That has become an idol. And for some people, look, I've got peers that do this. Uh, and being a former coach, uh, I know lots of folks that do this. Uh, Jesus is number one except they're in blank season and then something else takes priority. Jesus is number one. Let's just go ahead. I like to hunt, so I'll pick on the hunter. Jesus is number one except they're in hunting season. Uh, Jesus is number one except they're in ball season. And somehow we rationalize that our seven-year-old needs to miss 26 Sundays a month so we can be on the Little League ball field or she can be on the Little League softball field. All of a sudden what happens is we have an idol on our hands. You say, I try to pick on that baseball and softball. Well, it may just be your favorite TV show. And I know we've got a lot more folks that are religious that stay at home. You know what I'm talking about? The mattress Methodist and the Bed Coast Baptist. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes we just give in to laziness because we are filled with our own ways. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. amen. So let's look at the text here this morning and understand there's a result of exaltation. And I think it's all good for the born-again believer. Look in verse number 9. First of all, let's ask ourselves, who exalted Jesus? In verse number 9, the Bible says, Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted Him. Everybody say, God did it. One, two, three. God did it. That's right. That Jesus needs to be number one in your life and in your heart and in your mind and in your soul and in everything that you do, then what you really have is a God issue in its core because God's the one that said Jesus is the one worthy of that. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. amen. And the next question off that, though, is notice the things God not only exalted him, he highly exalted him. We need to understand in a real sense, we like to come on Sundays. Is God just exalted in your vocabulary on Sundays? Is he just exalted on the worship days that the church sets aside? Is he just exalted even on Sunday between 11.30 and when I hush? Is he just exalted in Sunday school at 9.30 or 10.30 or 5 or 6 or whatever it is? He's worthy to be exalted at all times in our lives. And whether we exalt him or not, he's already been exalted by God the Father. Everybody say that. We need to understand that. Matthew Henry, a theologian and uh, commentator on the Bible, said this about it. He said, the exaltation of Christ was God's way of recognizing the humiliation of Christ. Let that sink in for just a moment. In other words, what Jesus did, now get a vision of this, uh, when Jesus uh, descended here and was sent here for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, the Son of Almighty God, who is also God, left the portals of glory and came to this earth. Trey's already testified, this earth is hard sometimes. Your life ever been hard? Say amen. amen. You ever been hurt? Say amen. amen. You ever been downtrodden or talked to in a bad way? meeting at church, we'll move on. And then when we leave church, it's even harder. Amen? Amen. We need to understand in a real sense that this life is difficult. This life is difficult. And this world's evil. And when we think about the God of glory, He had a pretty good gig, if I can put it in common terms. And yet, Dre, he loved you enough, and he loved me enough, and he loved you, sir, and you, madam. He loved us enough to leave that come and die. It's a humiliating day. That's right. Amen. Why did he do that? Because he loved us. Amen. Amen. Do you know what makes me stop by and bring my wife flowers every now and then at home? Usually because I've talked about her from the pulpit. Amen. <laughs> Or there's been a funeral and I went by, no, I'm just teaching. <laughs> Usually it's, it's just because I love her. I don't plan to do those things. And she rarely gets that kind of stuff on a special day. It's usually just a day that the, I'm impressed to let my wife know I love her. And now I've got daughters that are getting older and when I walk in and give my wife flowers, you know what they, they look and go, <laughs> what about us? Boy, 
Well, Jesus was humiliated for me and you. Jesus was humiliated for me and you. Matthew Henry would argue that one of the reasons he was exalted by God the Father so high is because of the great humiliation he suffered in order that sinful man might be reconciled back to God. And God the Father recognized the work of Jesus, the Son, if you will, and said, hey, you were willing to go through all that. By the way, uh, there were times you remember in the garden, he even said, oh, Lord, please let this cup pass from me. Please let this cup pass from me. But then he backed up and said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. He went through that because it was part of the Father's plan and because He loved the Father, but also because He loved me and you. What are the effects? Look in verse number 9 again. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him, and look here, and given Him a name which is above every name. Now I want you to catch this. His name is above every name, and everybody say it. Amen. The key is whether you recognize it and treat it that way. See, His name still exalted above every name. The key is when we recognize that and are we doing that in our life. His name is exalted. Uh, it's just true. Look, I can get right here right now and I can climb up on this wall. I'm not going to do that. The OM's here. He'd be like, they've got some nut out there at Bethlehem. Like, and, and I can... they got some nut out there at Bethlehem. Like everybody said. Amen. Good. I can get up on that and I can say, look, I don't believe in gravity anymore. And I can jump. Now, I know there'd be four or five dickens right there in the crowd kitchen. You know I mean? <laughs> as much as I aggravate y'all, y'all would be like, uh huh, he deserved that. <laughs> and I could even be sincere that I don't believe that gravity exists anymore. But when I leave there at 260 and some of none of your business pounds, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go down pretty quick. See, the name's exalted already. Notice who gave the name. God gave the name, and it is a name above all names. Why? It's in honor. It's in honor. The title of dignity is given in honor. Look in verse number 10, that at the name of Jesus. Then see, at the name of Jesus. Now, do we do this in our mind? Do we do this in our hearts? Do we do this in our lives? Do we do this in our worship service? Do we do this in our private time? Do we do this on a Tuesday when the Lord speaks to us? It says, at the name of Jesus. Then every knee should bow. As the knee bows, see, it symbolizes, if you will, it shows that we respect the great power. The name gives the Lord dignity. The bowing of the knee recognizes the power of Almighty God. And by the way, when you really think about this, uh, I want you to catch this real quick. Everybody raise your right hand. Now look, if your neighbor raises the wrong hand, don't let it be a stumbling block to you. All right? Amen. That'll come to you in a second. Sometimes we lift the hand up to the Lord, don't we? Now let you left one. And you might not have done that in church, and some of you might have done that on a police car. <laughs> but it's the same philosophy, even if it was with a policeman behind you. What is it? It's surrender. Put your hands down. Please. I should have said, please, my wife does it. There's flowers in here. All right, now. <laughs> We surrender because we recognize His power. Amen. We surrender because we recognize His glory. We surrender because at His name, given by God and highly exalted, that the knees should bow because as we bow down, we exalt Him. And we need to spend more time in church. Listen, I'm not fussing teenagers. If you've got one, I'd just be real careful about it because I think we've tried to bring Jesus down to be a peer and it was never meant to be a peer because He's coming one day in great power and glory and honor and He is the King of kings and Lord of lords and we need to be careful. Our young people, oh baby, when we refer to Jesus as our homeboy and that kind of stuff and you've seen those t-shirts because here's what He really is. He is a friend like none other but He is still God of this universe and we need to understand when we think about the knee is a uh, bow, I'm going to bow down. And that's why I've told you all this at my funeral. I'm assuming somebody will come and for no other reason to go, good. All right, now, uh, so I'm assuming somebody will come. But at my funeral, if I live, if I live that long, God, I'm going to live till I die or the Lord comes. Amen? <laughs> at my funeral, I want somebody to sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, uh, because He's worthy. Really, really love.
love me. It makes no sense. The only comparison I can greatly come to that is my wife every morning. I know she gets up and says, Lord, I understand what it's like for you to love somebody that ain't worth being loved because you made me marry him. <laughs> See, I got tired of getting beat up the last two or three weeks here. I'm trying. Still with me, say amen. amen. Verse number 11 is what it says. It then goes on and says that, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I think this is important. As you read that every tongue is going to confess. Uh, we're kind of, we kind of get fired up a little bit. We kind of get motivated a little bit. We kind of get, I don't know, almost, we almost smile at church. <laughs> Two of you almost said amen. I mean, we, we get kind of excited when we think about this right here. There's coming a day because we're tired of hearing about all the evil. We're tired of hearing about all the bad. We're tired of hearing about uh, how it seems like the devil's winning some battles. Listen, it may seem like the devil's winning some battles, but I know who's going to win the war. Amen. And when we look in the, wor uh, the world around us and those kind of things, we kind of long, man, we're longing for a day when Christians will not be persecuted and, and evil will quit seemingly triumph over good in these pockets of the world and different things or even in our own community. And when the courts will reverse some decisions and we're tired of it looking like the evil's going to win, we're looking forward to a day that every time we'll confess. Now go back to the last part of verse 10. See, every tongue confessing reinforces what verse 10 said at the end. Heaven, earth, and under the earth. It's universal. It's from eternity to eternity that God has highly exalted Jesus. That's why when I get in a situation, I don't know what to do. I've got a conference. I don't know what to say. I've got this going on in my life. I just start naming the name of Jesus. I'll just sometimes just say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know why? Because I might be get, I might get, get cowardly. I might get timid. I might give in. I might be subject to let the Lord down. But I know the devil's still afraid of his name even when I don't know how to call upon him. I'm going to say Jesus, 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 I need you this morning. When we think of those things, look in verse number 11. Every nation, language, is going to proclaim the universal redeemer. See, that's important we get that, church. Because we're living in a world where folks are trying to come up with multiple paths to get to heaven. Multiple paths to eternal life. And we just need to be narrow-minded on some things. I've I told you this before about that narrow. And the Bible says, and still tells us, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man gets to the Father but by me. You believe that? Say amen. amen. College students, listen. If you're in a secular institution, the devil's going to send a professor your way and try to trip you up. High school students, it may be that as well. I'd love to tell you every book that they give you in school is going to be lined up with the Word of God. It's not. You have to be well-grounded, and you need to make sure that you're spending time in God's Word. And parents, uh, you can't wait for them to grow up and then make choices and try to lead them. You better be from the time they're conceived in the womb, training them in the way they should go. And when they're old, the Bible says they will not depart from it. And we need to understand in a real sense that we're in a war. But sometimes we take that war for granted. Amen. What happens when a ball team overlooks an opponent they should beat? They get upset. Boy, but when you get upset in eternal matters, there's consequences for a long time. Now, if that makes sense, amen. amen. Look at verse number 11 as well. There's a glory of exaltation. At the last part of verse number 11, here's what it says. All of these things to the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Now, how many of you today, if I have said, how many of you want to please the Heavenly Father? How many of you would have said, Amen? But most of all of us would have raised our hands, shouted, Amen. How many of you want to please the Father? Amen, that's right, because you're all trained. You say, Amen, I'll get you out down for lunch. That's right. But we should want to have a life that is pleasing and honoring to the Father. And what the Father said is, here's how you honor me, is you talk something good about my son. When you raise my son up, it honors the Father. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. amen. 
verse number 11 right there, it says the reason that God has highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, and his name every knee will bow, and it says in the whole universe there, and then it says in every tongue is going to confess why? To the glory of the Father. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter number 5. I'm going to ask you to turn physically to a couple of these. Again, I, if somebody ever fusses that you have to use your Bible at church, that's, that's a good thing. John chapter 5 and verse 23. Jesus says that all men should honor the Son. Now this is Jesus. Even as they honor the Father. But he that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. See, if the point of God exalting Jesus was ultimately to honor the Father, then we need to understand in a real sense, when we honor Jesus, when we exalt Jesus, when we praise Jesus, when we testify, when we sing, when we teach, when we preach, by the way, sometimes it's setting up in church paying attention and just saying amen. 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 That's right. That's good. We, we like it. Keep going. We're in for another hour. All right, good. Y'all think I'm kidding. All right, now, when you exalt Christ, you also want to defy. Somebody said, I'm not sure how to do that. Well, let me help you. How many of you like to talk? Nobody point at somebody else. Amen? <laughs> Raise your hand high if you like to talk. Then you got something to talk about. Boy, Jesus is something worth talking about. I want you to think right now in your mind how much you talk about here today that don't need the time that we give it to be talked about, but yet Jesus is worthy to be talked about. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Hey, he's worth talking about. How many of you like to sing in church? Raise your hand like to sing. How many of you like to sing in the shower? How many of you can't sing but you like to anyways? Nothing wrong with it. All right, hey, amen. Uh, when I sit in church, I rarely sing the right words. I like it. And when somebody gets annoyed, I sing loud. Well. Pray don't ever do this to me. I told a song, if you're still with me, say amen. amen. I told a song later one time, I said, look, we want a little fellowship today. We won't shake hands with each other. I want, so as we sing, we were singing, leaning on the everlasting arms. How many of you know that song, Reggie? Oh, good. We'll sing it in a minute. No. <laughs> and I said, listen, I'm going to go back. We've got some visitors in the very back of the church. I'm going to go shake their hands. I'm going to go see them. And just keep right on, let everybody fellowship, and let the piano keep going until I get back to the front. And about the time I got to the back, the song leader said, Let's sing. So I did. I came back up the aisle. Everybody else was starting, What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Everybody know the song? Say me. Amen. And I came back up here. I have no idea why he started singing. I told him to wait till I got back. <laughs> he is messing up. Drives me crazy. Now, I'm just singing something. <laughs> I made that up, as a matter of fact. I did. My family will testify I really do these things. Y'all didn't ask enough questions when y'all about to call the pastor, did you? Amen. Y'all should have talked to my doctor. And anyways, <laughs> as I got to the back of the church, I wanted to see those visitors, but I said, let's wait till we all get back there. So I just started singing. Now I was being kind of silly and kind of ugly that day, but guess what? You don't have to be on the key to please the Lord. But now some people will call the Lord to be special singers. Some will be traveling singers. Some will be choir members. And there's something to be said for those that just uplift their voice to the name of Jesus. Not only do we have something to talk about, church, we got something to sing about. Amen. Matter of fact, let me tell you something. Uh, how many of you over oh, your life have ever had some questions about angels or anything like that? You ever had a question about angels? Raise your hand real quick. All right, up and down. Good. Yeah, let me tell you this. You got a song angels cannot sing. You're redeemed. You're redeemed. You're redeemed. Angels ain't redeemed. I, ain't, I shouldn't use poor grammar. Angels are not redeemed, but born-again Christians are. And I sing a song angels cannot sing. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I got something to talk about. I got something to sing about. Everybody say it. Amen. Number three, we got something to shout about. That's going to challenge some of you. You know that that... 
You really ready to come for something this morning because you went. <laughs> oh, but I got something to shout about. Because I know a man carrying the can. Amen. Life's been a mess before. And the devil's working on our minds and on our hearts. He's working on the minds and hearts of our students, of our adults. And senior adults, don't you dare think that you're above the Lord. But let me tell you this, you might have retired from secular work, but there's never a place that you should retire from being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ in your saving years. Because when you do, you put it on cruise control spiritually. And you're, as you're trying to finish and cross the finish line, you could end up backsliding or having an eye on this one. I got something to shout about. I'm not talking about a fanatical show. I'm not talking about putting on a show. I'm not talking about anything fake. I'm just saying I got something to shout, to proclaim to the world around me. Sing it aloud. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. I got something to shout about. Fourthly, though, real quick, I got something to pray about. You don't ever have something to pray about. Because not everybody has that same thing to talk, sing, and shout about. Because they're not in relationship with Jesus. And church, we need to understand, coming to church doesn't make you a born-again Christian anymore than me going to McDonald's makes me a happy man. I've had several. <laughs> Only the fat free ones, amen? <laughs> I want you to be sure this day that your relationship is more than just with a building. But we have an important teacher that you got. I want you to make sure your relationship's with Jesus. Listen, in man's search, I want you to catch this. You're still with me, say me. I'll start the message in a minute. Just stay with me. Sometimes we get confused and think that our lives are searching for God. And it's not. All of our lives is God searching for us. Amen. That's why He sent Jesus. We're glad for Jesus today, say amen. amen. And as He sent Jesus in search of us, maybe today for the first time in a long time, you felt something. Maybe today just God's challenging your heart to be the godly parent. That you're not exalting Jesus and you're worried the kids don't so see Jesus exalted in your heart, in your life, in your home, in the way you coach, in the way you teach, in the way you mow the yard or anything else. I think it's important we understand in a real sense that perhaps we need to look at today are we exalting Christ? Am I exalted? Christ. Boy, I do on Sunday when I get to that party on Friday night. It's tough. Boy, I do on Sunday when I get the remote control in my hand at 9 o'clock and after the kids are in bed. I know it doesn't happen up in Hamlin County, but in other parts of the state, that's a real problem. I suspect it's a real problem here, too. That there's moments, there's days when I'm with certain people, I don't lift up Jesus like I need to. But if God sent Jesus for us, and said, He is exalted. How many of us are willing to pray that we'll exalt Him today with all we are? With our mind, with our body, and with our soul. No one needs you may stumble. But you have an advocate with the Father. Which is just another reason that we want to exalt and recognize the exaltation of Jesus. Because we want to honor the Father. Would you stand your feet and bow your heads today? Positions are prepared to come with him and respond. I have no idea what God's sharing with you. Maybe it's just been God challenging your heart to acknowledge his exaltation in an area of your life. Maybe you want to come and just bring your children too and even pray with them and say, to our best of our ability, our family is going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't know exactly what to do and you want to come and just find a place to pray and say, I want to honor the Father. And you want to just ask Him, Father, how do I exalt Jesus more in my life than I am right now? Is He number one in everything? All the time? Look, we're all just a group of folks trying to live life the best we can. But I suspect we've all had periods 
may be in one where Jesus isn't as important as he needed to be. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of response. I'll have you pray with any of you about anything. But I'm also, as we begin, in just a moment, I'm going to kneel right here. And I'm just going to say, Lord, I want to be the person that exalts you in all things and ask you for strength and guidance. Don't listen to Shane's invitation this day. But please listen to the Holy Spirit's. Please listen to the Lord's this very moment. You're here today. You're not 100% sure heaven's your home and Christ is your Lord and Savior. The greatest way to exalt Jesus is to surrender your life to Him and say, I want Him to be in charge of me from this day forward. And we can show you in God's Word where you can know that for sure. Father, to your hands, we commit this time. Help men, women, and spirits to be obedient to your voice. 